Hello, Josh. How are you? Well, I've taken to just responding by saying uh, healthy and safe, because if I say anything more than that, like, oh, I'm doing well, that requires separating my fate from the fate of people around who are doing badly. So healthy and safe. You? Very glad to hear it. I, I, I'm uh, happy to be able to report that I can affirm both healthy and safe on this end. Yeah. Uh, I'm very concerned and I'm very worried, but let me introduce this. I'm Glenn Lowry. This is the Glenn show, the Glenn show with bloggingheads.tv. Uh, and I'm with Josh Cohen. Uh, and Josh is, uh, who are you, Josh? Um, I work at, uh, Apple at Apple, teach at Apple university. I also teach at UC Berkeley and I'm editor of uh, Boston review editor since 1991 of Boston review. Josh is a political theorist, an old friend of mine, and uh, we, we need the uh, benefit of his wisdom at this time. Uh, the country's burning, Josh. Yeah. The country, yeah, it's, um, I, 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 we, we've been around, uh, we've both been around for a pretty long time, uh, about the same amount of time. Yeah, yeah, man, I can even remember the 1960s. And, uh, yeah, yeah, no, I was, I was at a meeting. I was at a meeting the other day and, and somebody said, you know, since the 1960s. And I said, well, of the 15 people in the room, I'm the only one who was around in the 1960s. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, this does, this does feel worse than any moment that I remember more dangerous, more parlous, uh, more potentially calamitous than, uh, uh, anything, any moment that I remember in the, uh, in the 1960s. Uh, but maybe I'm misremembering or exaggerating the dangers of the moment. But I, I do think, you know, we're in this situation where at take and taking these in no particular order, uh, you've got a public health and economic crisis. 106,000 people, uh, dead at least from COVID-19. 40 million unemployed. People. It's it, terrible. I mean, this is since calamitous. You know, 106,000 people. Uh, and, and of course, more to come and, uh, and probably resurgences, uh, if not fueled by the lack of distancing at the, uh, the protests, which we'll get to, uh, fueled by um, the uh, d difficulties of opening up uh, 40 million people filed for unemployment insurance. And that's, the, and then if you look at any, any indicator of pain or hardship, uh, you know, uh, disparate impact of that as always, and connected to the other themes that we'll, we'll get to disparate impact of the, public health and uh, economic crisis in terms of uh, if, if you look at infection rates among black Americans higher, if you look at infection fatality rates higher. Um, and we can talk about why, but what, but let's just stick with the pattern here, the disparate impact there. And also I think a, a serious, you know, public policy failure. I mean, Dealing with a pandemic, an epidemic or a pandemic, it's a hard uh, problem. Um, but I think it's been, it was pretty clear uh, from early on what general measures need to be needed to be taken in terms of scaling up testing. We've done 19 million tests so far. That's what we should be doing uh, every week, not every three months. Uh, failures on tracing. You haven't really built up the contact tracing forces that are required to collaborate with the testers or the supported isolation. This is, I've been worked with uh, Danielle Allen and others at the Kennedy School on this pandemic resilience project, TTSI, testing yes. trace, supported isolation. I've been following it very closely. And um, th that just hadn't been done. And, th you know, people, I don't, there are lots of different plans. There's the Kennedy School thing. But the basic parameters are not that mysterious. It was a, a, a public policy failure and partly a public policy failure because a capacity failure. My, um, 
uh, if you look at the um, the book uh, Fifth Risk, um, it's, I don't know. Yeah, yeah, Michael Lewis. This is you know the Moneyball Michael Lewis. And I know him. Uh, yeah, and the fifth risk is the is the is is the risks around the failure uh, project management. It's basically a a, a a a small and terrifying book about the destruction of public sector capacity at the national level in the United States. So you got a uh, public health and economic crisis with disparate impact reflecting a policy failure and capacity. I assume this uh, capacity failure has been a long time in the making. It's been a long time in the making. Uh, Yes. Uh, You could say, just let's just arbitrarily pick a number. Let's say like 40 years in the making. Um, I mean, I would associate the, the, the long-term trajectory here with the, uh, the, the, the shift in sensibilities in, to use this overused term, neoliberal direction in the, around 1980. Um, we, 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 we can talk about the propriety of that term, but you know, I'm just marking a period of time. Um, okay. and, uh, and, you know, but, you know, at, with some... Oh, uh, let, me, let me interrupt. Do you think that the ideological differences between left and right as between the quote-unquote Reagan revolution on the one hand and the progressive sen- sensibilities on the other are implicated in the diminishment of, uh, of public capacity at the national level? The Democrats would do it better. Uh, the, the, the laissez-faire vision of the of the conservatives is, impl- is is part of the problem here? I mean, I'm asking you if that's what you think. Uh, what I think is that there was a general shift in sensibilities. And you can, if you look at the, what again, to go back to 1980, because we're old enough to uh, okay. do that. Uh, you know, I think um, the shift in the Democratic Party uh, I identified at the time. I mean, it was, this was not a mystery that was going on at the time. It was identified as a conflict between, you know, you know, Carter and, uh, and, and, uh, Ted Kennedy, uh, for all his, uh, def- famous, uh, deficiencies, uh, um, uh, you know, Gary Hart, Mike Dukakis, and then, uh, the, and then Clinton. I mean, there was a yeah, very really shift, uh, 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 the, the, uh, the, to the view that the, uh, public capacity, uh, you know, was not, I'm s- simplifying greatly, but the public capacity was not so important. There were, di- and there were different variants of this, but I think it's pretty clear that there was a, gen- a general shift, uh, in, uh, political sensibilities and it's been a dominant, uh, dominant in the country, but, but there are differences. I don't want to say there are no differences or it's only a dime's worth of difference between them, but there, there are differences, but I think there is a general shift in sensibility. But I, in, in addition to that, that's the public health. That's one part of the uh, trouble, the very worrisome character of the current situation. The second part is that there's a social crisis, a social crisis crystallized in this public publicly observed uh, lynching in Minneapolis. I mean, it was, uh, I, I, I Why do you call it a lynching? Seriously, it's a serious question. It was a horrible uh, police brutality killing of a man. That's true. Why are we calling it a lynching? Because the man was black. Why would it be any less egregious an offense against our sensibilities uh, and our, our moral commitments if the victim of that had been white? How do you know? And I'm really kind of playing devil's advocate here, but it's yeah, a serious yeah. question. How do you know that the motivations of the uh, uh, rogue police officer who took that man's life were racial? You know, I, 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 I don't know. Uh, I'm not talking about his motivations. I'm talking about, uh, you know, a pattern of uh, violence. Uh, and, and I call it a lynching par- really f- partly because he, put his, he didn't put a rope around his neck. But he put a knee on his neck and kept it there until he was dead. It was horrible. There's yeah. no doubt that it was horrible. And but the word, the word lynching, and I'm asking this for, for a serious reason. The word lynching evokes a very long political history. And I want to know the connection of this event to that history. Well, uh, look at the, the, the uh, you know, Philando Castile was also in Minneapolis. 
uh, the Minneapolis police don't have a great track record of protecting uh, black citizens. Minneapolis has, and to, to, to widen the scope here, Minneapolis, if you look at economic inequality, wealth and income inequality in Minneapolis, it's, it's bad even by national standards. You know, it's about 2.5x in, uh, on, on income and wealth in uh, Minneapolis. And, you know, it's partly because, you know, I don't know w- w- what was on his mind or in his heart. I know what was on his face. And there was a look of, he's a smug prick. And he had his hand in his pocket. Is it, I saw it, man. I saw it. You, I know you saw it. And As actually, you, you know, like he was kneeling to pray or bored in church or something like that. I mean, it was that, horrible. That's right. And so when I saw it, um, at, at part of the so, so it's partly I'm thinking of this as it's on his neck. Partly it's the pattern of racial enforcement and violence. Partly it's the smug look on his face and the hand in his pocket. Partly it's the conspicuous display of this as if, and I don't know what was on his mind or on his heart, but a conspicuous display of it as if part of the point of this was to say to people, you see what I'm doing? See, I can do this. Yeah. So it's about, it's, it's the reinforcement of, you know, to speak in kind of functionalist terms here, it's about the reinforcement of this, racial hierarchy, racial subordination. Uh, but it happens I, to I, white I, people too, Josh. You know that. This this event, I mean, in fact, uh, someone sent me a link to this uh, something in Dallas. Uh, I can't remember the guy's name. It was a white guy that basically uh, had his life taken in some horrible police encounter when yeah. he wouldn't do exactly what they told him to do when they tried to restrain him. And the guy was crying out for his life and he dies. I wish I could, uh, I could send you yeah. the... But the point is, point is, and then there was a press conference uh, sometime afterwards, and his mother is depicted there, and she's weeping yeah. and talking about yeah. how they brutally killed her son. Yeah. He was a white guy. Uh, yeah. That event did not occasion uh, the national uh, uproar that this one has done. And I'm, I'm not trying to be picky here. I'm, I'm really no, no, trying I, to say something, you know, yeah. because the police are off the chain here in this country in many yeah. municipalities. That's a first order issue, but. Yeah. It doesn't have to be a racial issue unless we make it so. And, and so I'm, I'm trying to, you know, kind of interrogate that a little bit. Yeah. So you, uh, you're not going to get any argument from me uh, that it was that the uh, that this is a, a, an exclusively racial issue at all. Um, and you're not going to get any argument about. Uh, how bad it is to be criminalizing a bunch of petty shit, mass incarceration, which you've written about so uh, uh, powerfully, which is not just a racial issue, but it is also. Uh, no, no rules on uh, cops and a militarization of the equipment that police have. All of that's true. In a context, however, in which there's a long history of racial subordination, which again, you've written about, you understand way better than me. And, and it's not just a matter of identity. Uh, it's also a matter of you've, you've written the books <clears throat> and done the research and thought about it and thought of it. So you know what better than me. But against that background, I think it's important also to call out the, uh, the, the racial aspect of this, because in addition to the commonality of unjustified, unjust abuses of people, which people who are empowered by the state to enforce the laws should particularly not be doing. In addition to that, there is an element of this pattern of racialized police action, which reinforces uh, this longstanding racial inequality and subordination in the country. So I think it's important. That's, that's the reason that, you know, when I write down the set of names and I've got George Floyd and I've yeah. got Eric Garner and I've got Tamir Rice, I've got Emmett Hill, uh, Emmett Till, Emmett Till on my list. Cause I think of I, now it's at least, and so let me, 
is there a, is it obvious that this is part of a pattern? I think it helps to think, I, I put the thing around the other way. I'd say, why not see it that way? You ask me why see it that way, and I think that's a fair question. I've given you some at least high rhetorical <laughs> reasons. I don't want, but I, I want to be like, why not? Okay, let me, let me answer your question. I, I, I have two answers. Um, one has to do with the broadened base of um, uh, political protest against the institutional practices that we abhor, okay? Yeah. Uh, this has to do with police training. It has to do with police accountability. It has to do with police rules of engagement, et cetera. So that's a serious issue of public policy. The more people that one has uh, lined up to uh, argue for reform in that area, the better one is. Uh, casting the problem as a universal problem that affects all citizens gives you the chance of putting together a more effective coalition to get the policies changed. So more allies, if I say we're all or susceptible to being victimized in this way, which is indeed the case. We are all susceptible. Yeah. Those uh, African-Americans will be statistically uh, at, at greater risk. Yeah. But the other reason uh, that I give is I, I just fear that the racialization of this kind of discourse, which, which is very far advanced now, um, uh, invites uh, a look at uh, the full picture of uh, criminal victimization, not only where the police are the perpetrators, and the overrepresentation of African Americans amongst offenders is a prominent fact about that situation. So if I start talking about people getting killed by people in a different race, and I start just counting how many white people are killed by black people, how many black people are killed by white people? There's a lot more white people killed by black people than there are black people killed by white people, even though blacks are a minority of the population. Yeah. Uh, there are all kinds of heinous crimes that are being undertaken where whites are being victimized by blacks, looking at the robbery statistics, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. So, I mean, I, I fear the day when I have a mob of white people out in front of the courthouse demanding that black criminals who are perpetrating these awful crimes yeah. in our society um, be punished. And I think we're seeing it a little bit when we see militia looking uh, whites who are brandishing weapons out in front of their uh, residential uh, enclaves or their businesses, almost yeah. daring somebody to, to come up. I, I shudder to think what these conversations look like, which we enlightened on the coast will dismiss, you know, amongst just ordinary workaday Joes uh, who happen to be white. Uh, and like their hunting and fishing um, and keep their weapons and appreciate their Second Amendment rights. I shudder to think, you know, we dismiss them on the coast as, oh, they're just a bunch of racists and white supremacists. You know, we, we think that we can rule them out of, out of court because they, they're moral reprobates. Uh, once this racialized conversation continues in this way, you, we invite a, a, a racialized backlash that I, that I shudder to, to contemplate. So, those are my reasons to yeah. to think about it as something that's happening to Americans, rogue cops who need to be held accountable and punished, and to enumerate the cases of white victims of this uh, police uh, violence as well as blacks, uh, because I want a broad coalition and because I really don't want to have the crime and punishment or conversation in the country so thoroughly racialized. I think that works to the detriment of blacks in the long run. Um, you... You may be right about the, you know, working to the detriment, but I think if you don't call that out, uh, first of all, you're mis, you know, you're misrepresent, I mean, you know, the, about the nature of in the, uh, uh, mass incarceration. Why am I telling Glenn Lowry this about mass incarceration? You know, no, it's a, uh, it, if you don't call that out, you're distorting in the name of some speculation about what the most likely political project to succeed is uh you're you know burying uh, i think uh you're distorting what the the facts are and uh, uh burying an important part of the uh, you know in, an important part of the issues you know there's I, i'm reminded as we're talking about this about universalization and the relationship between universal and i'm all in favor of that universal and the, the racial side, there was a very, there was a great, um, really provocative and interesting piece by a woman named 
Kamara Jones, who used to be president of the American Public Health Association, 2016, I think she was president of the American Public Health Association. It was a piece that she did in April uh, about the, the issues about what hospitals should be doing in face of potential shortage of ventilators. Yeah. And what she was concerned about was that if the, you know, the hospital, including the ethics committee of the hospital yeah. said, what we should be doing is making decisions based on years of life saved. Yeah. What you're doing is reinforcing racial disparities in life expectancy. You could say you're reflecting them, but she was concerned that you're reinforcing them. So she said, not exactly as a proposal, but as a, you know, as a thought, she said, maybe there should just be a lottery. You get to the hot. They're allocated on the basis of a lottery. That's going to get rid of implicit bias because you have a rigid rule. Yeah. Of, and you also don't reinforce the background inequalities. But then she made what I thought was just, it's, it's a great crystallization of this issue, I think. She said, and also, if you know that that's how the hospital is going to be allocating the ventilators, whoever you are, you're going to want there to be a lot more ventilators. So basically you're going to want a policy that's going to increase the supply of ventilators. So no matter who you are, you're going to get the help you need, or maybe you hope you'll be able to get it um, uh, rather than allocating them in a way that uh, where people think, well, I can, I've got my individualized or group identity based strategies of self protection from the uh, f uh, from the virus. So I thought it was an interesting case of beginning an argument about racial disparities. But then you up with a universal it, argument. I mean, you want to make a case for uh, you know we're in it together. She was saying have a lottery, and then you're you're making people in it together because they don't they're not experiencing uh, being in it together. I, I I think it would be dereliction though here. Having said, we've, we've talked a little bit about the public health and economic crisis. We've talked about this social civic crisis, but there's also on top of it all. Um, and I, here again, I think worse than. Um, 1968, though, if Rick Perlstein were here and said, no, 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 that was worse, I, I defer to his historical uh, knowledge and judgment, which is, uh, you know, we got this election coming up. Yeah. Five months. And, uh, you know, Chad, hanging Chad's 2000, I mean, it's going to be hanging Chad's all, you know, everywhere. Uh, if every place is going to be every, there are going to be incredible legal challenges and contests and people are standing up there, you know, they're lawyering up in uh, every state. Uh, you're running a camp. People are campaigning in a, a pandemic you have. And I, I don't want to, you know, do this as a kind of both sides thing. I think you've got a part one party. I think the Republican party is really Lots of people in the Republican Party are down with the, the Republican Party leadership anyway, down with a kind of an authoritarian strategy. Uh, you mean in response to the uh, disturbances of, associated with protests? I, I think more broadly. I think more uh -huh. broadly uh, with a kind of, uh, you know, exaggerate, you know, emphasis on, you know, the uh, independent autonomy of the executive of the president, um, but who uh, but who also have checked pretty generally responded to the current situation um, by, I think, heavily over-indexing on the, uh, the, the, you know, the need for a, you know, a, 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 you know, a, a, a display of power in response to the civic uh, disturbances. So, and so you've got a political, you've got crisis around democracy, a civic crisis, and a, so, a, a public health and economic crisis. We haven't even taught, I mean, not to be, you know, go down, you know, the litany, but this, this is putting aside issues about, you know, climate and, you know, the 
planet burning up or so, I mean that could next week three we've days. We've got time for that. If we're we still got, alive I, in a year, we could come back to it. Yeah, of course. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> anyway, that's that that's all that, that's why I think this is a uniquely uh uh potentially calamitous situation. And and just one to to wrap a bow around this, you know, it's like apocalyptic in the original sense of the term, like apocalypse as in revelation or uncovering or de- it's like you're in this situation where you've got the, the the police killing and you've got the pandemic and you have the the this political crisis around the election and each of these is a focused expression of these deep long standing unresolved social economic political issues uh and but, but, so and the only if I, if I want to, you know, lift myself up a little bit, because, you know, I'm, I, I always have think, I've always thought, I continue to think that a kind of pessimism of the will, you know, pessimism of the, pessimism of the intellect is fine. Pessimism of the will and the heart is a kind of privilege, you know, and so you should not embrace the privilege. So then I go back and I think that democracy is hard. It's always hard. Democracy is hard. Fairness, hard. Justice, it's hard. And above all, building a multiracial, multi-ethnic, ethnic, and let's expand it out, multi-religious, religiously pluralistic democracy, it, it, it's hard. It's really hard. And the fact is, it, it hadn't been tried that often. And if you think in, the, in American history, it wasn't tried until sort of in Reconstruction. And that ended. And then it, that project of really trying effectively to build a multiracial, multi-ethnic, ethnic, religiously pluralistic democracy really, you know, picks up again, you know, over the course of our lifetime. And it's hard. There are not any models out there. And so my hopeful, I won't say optimistic, but hopeful sense is, you know, this is, you know, th- th- these are the difficulties that come with trying to do something that's worth doing, but it's really hard to do. I wrote a, a, a piece I shared it with you uh, recently. It hasn't appeared yet. Yeah. I think it's going to end up at Quillette. Uh, actually, um, yeah, I'm afraid you were going to say that. <laughs> yeah, I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, if we could go into it, but, but I, I, you can, I, you know, you you run a magazine, so you know how it is. Editors uh, sometimes get very overbearing, man. Yeah, I know. I'm the one that's writing the piece, but it's your it's your organ, and you know you don't want to. You know, you think you can tell me what to say? You can't tell me what to say. <laughs> Yeah, I can tell. I can tell you where you can say it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that you could do. <laughs> okay. Anyway, uh, the point of which uh, in this piece is uh, uh, the violence and the looting have got to be denounced, even as we acknowledge that protest is legitimate and that there are uh, there's righteous anger, and uh, there really needs to be changed. Uh, the violence and the looting have to be denounced, especially by the people who are most earnestly. Uh, committed to uh, the the cause of uh, of the protest, that it delegitimates the protest, and that it's also wrong. It's straight up wrong that the fact of the injustice against which the protest is uh, uh, aimed uh, doesn't convey a license to uh, uh, ignore one's responsibilities as a citizen. It doesn't give you the right to uh, loot and pillage uh, and vandalize other people's property. And it certainly doesn't give you the right to attack uh, police officers uh, who are simply doing their jobs. They're out there trying to maintain crowd control, trying to keep the crowd from overrunning the whatever. You're throwing uh, projectiles at them and you're shooting at them and whatnot. This is not right and it should be denounced. And to my chagrin and surprise, a lot of people think, well, okay, you're right, violence isn't so good, but this is not the time to say that. And that just befuddles me. It seems to me this is exactly the time to say that. Yeah. And so I've come to you, my wise political philosopher friend, to get uh, it, help me understand what's wrong with denouncing 
violence and looting. Why can't people be <laughs> clear about the distinction between that and uh, being against the protest? I'm not against the protest. Yeah. Um, I- I'm going to answer the question more directly, but let me just ask you a pre- prefatory question, sure. which is, what do you think about civil disobedience in, in this circumstance? You understand why I'm asking the question. And it's yeah, not no, a strategy of evading a good question that you're asking. I, I, I think I'm not a political philosopher. I, I know that there are important and interesting books that have been written about civil disobedience. I've even read some of them, Michael Walzer's, for example. Uh, and, and I think a case can obviously, I mean, maybe not so obviously, but a case can be made for civil disobedience as an instrument of, um, of uh, protest and reaction against injustice. The law is unjust. Uh, I refuse to obey the law. I accept the consequences of my ref- refusal to obey the law under the law, but I nevertheless persist in my refusal to obey the law. That's my stand against what I regard to be the uh, injustice of the law. And that can be a, 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 a part of a broader strategy of getting the law changed and promoting social justice. So I, I would accept that. Yeah. But, so, I, but I don't think looting target is civil disobedience. I, I, that's why I said it's a prefatory. It's not it's not an evasion, but it's also not an answer. But the reason for asking it is because, you know, it, it, maybe this seems like hair splitting, but, you know, there is civil disobedience is violation of the law. So if you say this is, you know, it's fine to protest, but don't violate the law or I'm just putting violating the law on the other side of that. So if people are in Portland, Oregon are lying down on the bridge yeah. and they're breaking the curfew, I mean, it's true. They're making the job of the, of policing harder, but you know, that may be, it may be that that's the right thing to do. I do. So I want to just push that. And now, uh, Number one, I agree with you about um, the uh, the issue around uh, violence. Number two, I agree with you that uh, that it's the right time to say it. I mean, you know, either no time is the right time or every time is the right time. This is as good a time as any. The only thing that I maybe disagree with you about is that people haven't said it. I don't think people who've said it who are strongly embracing what the protest about have spent as much time and focus on it as you do in that piece. And that's a different thing. And it felt the piece that that you did felt imbalanced to me imbalanced because uh, there wasn't anything in the piece about um, the uh, police initiated abuses uh, you mean other than the one that happened to George Floyd? Yeah, a lot, well, the one in Atlanta where two uh, black college students were pulled from a car. They cops smashed. Oh, abuses uh, during the protests. I see. Abuses okay. during the protests. Yeah, the uh, yeah. And so I thought that w- that felt to me like it was uh, a kind of a missing uh, piece of what you were saying. And 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 I think you agree. I think this is something that you've written about before. Sure. In that kind of situation, there's a special responsibility on the part of um, police who are the, you know, arm of the state. They're supposed to be protecting everybody. They're supposed to be trained. They're supposed to have learned how to control themselves. And when they're using the power that's been vested, when they're abusing the power that's been vested in them, the special power and that they have a special. So I felt that was, that's been a big theme in discussion. I felt like it was mis, and I couldn't understand why that wasn't there. Or uh, the notice we succeeded. We've been talking for more than a half an hour, and we haven't mentioned the president, which is a great. Okay, success. well, let's get to that because that's that's really great. very. But I just want to say one thing. I want to yeah. say one thing. So you ask why, and my motivation, so this is personal. So I grew up in Chicago, south side of Chicago, yeah. uh, 75th in the Dan Ryan Expressway. At 79th in the Dan Ryan Expressway, there's a Walmart. Maybe it's yeah. at 83rd. There used to be a Walmart. Yeah. The local politician who's an African-American man 
fought tooth and nail to get Walmart to build that facility there. Why? Because it employs hundreds of people, yeah. because it serves the community, and because it makes it possible for other commercial enterprises, small shops and so forth, to flourish off of the traffic that the Walmart brings in, saving a whole city block from what otherwise might have been urban decay. Yeah. Okay. That Walmart had every stick of inventory looted from it, and then it was burned to the ground just a few days ago, yeah. a half mile from where I grew up. Now, uh, yeah, you know that's what I'm against. Okay, that that's the thing that I'm trying to say. You can't be doing this, man. Yeah, <laughs> you know. Well, I'm sure you've seen these videos, Glenn, and I've seen them, and they're kind of very moving and 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 important. I'm not saying they're representative, but you know, there were the uh, the so there would be a a couple of you know white guys or women. And they'll be busting something up. And then you'll get some black woman or man. Most of the ones that I've seen, it's women who say, basically, get the fuck out of here. Stop doing that. They don't always listen, but they say, stop doing it. And they say, we live here. I mean, all the things that you would say if you were in that circumstance. Yeah. So I, I, I am with them. OK, let's talk about the president because we're running out of time. Yeah. Well, I, that was another thing that I thought was missing from your piece. You know, there's this, uh, you know, disgusting photo op and uh, with the, you know, you know, waving the Bible around. I mean, it was the worst yeah. and fanning the flames. And, um, you know, you're not getting statements like, I mean, Lyndon Johnson, for all his flaws in 1968, is saying if you keep your boot on somebody's neck to go back to that image, for 300 yeah. years, you expect this kind of thing. So, I, you know, not that John, Johnson... Well, he impaneled the Kerner Commission and, uh, and you know, and took the their report seriously. Out and we never acted on what the Kerner Commission said. Let, let me just state for the record, I think the president is doing a very poor job leading the country at this critical moment. A very poor job. Yeah. Uh, I think he's not up to it. Okay. I, I mean, you know, I, I'm not one of these Trump bashers who every other word I want to say, you know, Trump is horrible. Trump is uh, a menace. Trump is a fascist. Uh, but it's it seems pretty clear to me that the the qualities of uh, rhetorical, um, of uh, emotive and um, uh, empathetic, of, uh, of, you know, kind of uh, sophisticated, and subtle uh, perception and instincts around the political and the social, the historical. He's not able to frame it. I don't know who his speechwriters are, but these speeches, which he should have been given, and he could just read them off the teleprompter he hasn't been given. I could write these fucking speeches, yeah. okay? I could write a speech that yeah. wouldn't be a Democrat pro-Biden speech, but that would be a speech about America, about our history, about the gravity of this moment, about the uh, uh, how much each of us has a responsibility to look within himself and herself about how we have to pull together about let's put our differences aside. They just tried to impeach me. I'm not worried about that. I'm not worried about that right now. The yeah. president doesn't have the gravity. He doesn't have the soulfulness. You know, if he read that Bible that he was holding up at that church across from the White House yesterday, if he had been reading it for the last 30 years, if he had spent as much time in Bible studies as I have spent in Bible studies, yeah. he'd be able to pray. He'd be able to pray from his heart to the country in ways that would get us to stop for a moment and say, oh, I thought this guy was an asshole. Actually, he's a human being. Maybe I ought to listen to what he has to say. He doesn't have the qualities to do that. I'm acknowledging that. Yeah. He also doesn't, I think, have the political motivation to do it because he could correctly be seeing an opportunity for himself here to salvage his presidency in this election that's forthcoming by playing the law and order card. It's got to be tremendously tempting to yeah. do that. He's got to be saying to himself, and I invite your response, that, you know, the media are not going to allow me to be anything other than the asshole that they've been painting me for the last four years to hell with him. I've done my sums. Me and Jared Kushner have sat down in a meeting with the computers and the data and whatnot. And I can get there from here in, uh, you know, Minnesota, in Michigan, in Ohio, in North Carolina. I can get there from here in Florida, in Arizona, et cetera, if I play this card. And this card is 
righteous indignation at the lawlessness of these people. And I'm going to be tough. The governor won't protect you. The mayor won't protect you. I'll protect you. And that's the card that he's playing. I can imagine that that's very tempting politically uh, to him. So together with the lack of the personal qualities on his part to be able to do something that's hard, this would be hard to lead the country at this moment. What a challenge. Uh, and to, and the, the political incentives, uh, which he is uh, susceptible to, it seems to me, lead to inevitably uh, uh, incidents like what we saw where he had the public authorities clear the area in Lafayette Park. And then he does the stunt of walking across from the White House with the attorney general and chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff. Yeah. 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 It's 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 very scary. It's scary. And, and you know, if. You know, I may lose friends by saying this. I would be a little bit less worried if Mike Pence were president. And if in you, the speech that you just you should not lose friends for that. <laughs> yeah, uh, and, of course and we I know he's not that, your first choice. <laughs> and I, I say that uh, not because I think that on the substance. Trump is a two sigma outlier from yeah. where the Republican uh, Party is or from where Mike Pence is. Uh, um, but uh, because it's a because it's a very this goes back to this earlier comments about how it's a public health and economic crisis, social civic crisis, political crisis. It's a very delicate situation. It's a, one of these knife edge situations where things can very easily uh, spin out of control. I mean, it would be, I would be surprised if sometime over the course of the next couple of days, there weren't some really, really horrible incident where, you know, uh, a bunch of people get killed, but, you know, comparable to whether it was, you know, Watts or Detroit or something like that, where a lot of people uh, get killed, you know, way more than got killed at Kent State. Uh, a bunch of people get killed. Um, and what you would like is that would be, which would be horrible. And what you would like is somebody where when things start to tip, they have the capacity to, you know, try to pull it back. And I think, I think the thing that he said to the governors the other day and this call that uh, was written about, it, it is the kind of core of his, political sensibility and being, which is you have to dominate these people. You, ha- you need a display of power. You got to al- arrest a lot of people, throw them in jail for 10 years, and then the, and then the problem will go away. I think that's the, that's what he believes is, you know, sort of fundamental to what people are like. I think it's completely delusional, uh, totally delusional about uh, how people would respond to that. But he thinks that what you can do is have a display of power, which will uh, inc- both incapacitate and demobilize through fear. Incapacitate by putting people, by incarcerating, and then demobilize other people through fear. And I don't think that's, I don't think people are in the mood for that. So what you want is somebody who's got a little bit more flexibility, a little bit more of a sensibility about how to lead and, and a little bit less encouraging of uh, attacks on journalists for being enemies of the people. And people do that and then they think they're acting righteously. A little bit less thinking that uh, being more tough and more brutal, which he has you know, been, you know, kind of a public advocate for on, for police, that that's really the right thing to do, that it's a sign of weakness if you're not doing that, that it shows that you're a jerk and a fit if you're not doing that. Uh, let me, it would be let nice me, to have somebody who had a little bit less of, of, of that. But I, I, I want to I wanna, I wanna I wanna play the devil's advocate again here, Josh. I'm going to push yep. back a little bit and play the devil's advocate. So okay. a police station, a police station was burnt to the ground in Minneapolis. Yeah. The local precinct, uh, uh, you know, uh, that uh, from which the officers who killed uh, George Floyd uh, reported, they reported to this precinct. And uh, in the uh, early days after uh, Floyd's death, this police station was burned to the ground. Now, I can see someone saying, think about that as a symbol. In fact, I heard Sean Hannity say this. 
Think yeah. about that as a symbol. They're burning police stations to the ground. What does that tell you? They stood by and let uh, the rabble, the mob, burn the police station to the ground. What does that tell you? It tells you that the police will not protect you. You're going to need to protect yourself. Um, and I can see a leader in that circumstance saying, oh, my God, things are spinning out of control. We must reestablish confidence in the minds of most people that the duly uh, constituted authorities will maintain order in the society. And so someone says the following thing. Here's the trade off. I'm, uh, uh, you know, I'm the National Guard or I'm the local police and they're burning a police station to the ground. I don't let that happen. And if I have to use deadly force to prevent it from happening, I'll do so. After all, if someone comes to your home to loot your home and burn it to the ground and you decide to defend your home by using deadly force, the law will stand behind you. You're perfectly entitled to do that. Why shouldn't public authorities use such forces as necessary? This is all hypothetical as devil's advocate in order to avoid a circumstance in which much, much more death and violence will ultimately ensue. Because once everyone loses confidence in the ability of the uh, police to maintain order and they take matters into their own hands, you're going to get a lot of kids shot outside of immigrant uh, shopkeepers uh, storefronts. You're going to get a lot of vigilante brandishing uh, weapons like the ones we saw in state capitals protesting against the shutdown, except now they're going to be brandishing their weapons against anybody who walks by with a Black Lives Matter sign. And that's not where we want to go. And therefore, when a leader says, uh, dominate the space, what he's saying is, do your job to maintain order, lest that uh, send the message to everybody in the society that there is no maintenance of order. And that's a world that we don't want to go to for everyone's sake. What do you say to that? Uh, I say two things to that. First of all, uh, you look, what, what does it mean to maintain order? You invoke the maintenance of order in the context in which the forces of order have just, and I'll go back to my original term, have just lynched somebody, done it. And, and by the way, this isn't like Schwerner, Cheney, and Goodman in the dark of the night, kidnapped, yeah. shot, and then buried to try yeah. to, this is somebody doing it in, yeah. knowing that he's being filmed, that people are watching him. So that's the first thing is I'd say, let's think a little bit harder about what the maintenance of order means to people in these circumstances. Okay. Not that. It means different things to different people, but that's part of what the meaning of the maintenance of order is under these circumstances. The other thing that I would say is uh, when – Maybe there are three points. This, the second one may be a little bit of a, a cheap point, but I think it's important, uh, which is when somebody says, you know, we got to display power in the battle space. And what they're talking about is yeah. dominating fellow citizens who they are obligated to protect. Yeah. So you, that should give you pause. You should re- say, whoa, 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 how did we get here? You know? Okay. So, and then I'd say uh, uh, there are. This is the whole point. There are way. There are lots of other ways to try to move forward in a circumstance like this than going to jumping from here's where we are to uh, let's bring in the military. Let's declare a public emergency. You know, let's throw a you know twenty thousand people in jail. Uh, let's not you know. Let's uh, maybe end up killing fifty or a hundred or hundred people. Uh, what you want to do is avoid that. And the idea that there's nothing to do, that you're so paralyzed and limited in your capacity to do anything that you got to go there. That shows that there's something wrong with your thinking. And, I, and again, I don't mean your. I mean the thinking of somebody. Yeah. Who, so. Uh, there are other options. Why would you go to that one? Unless you think, and this is to go back to the earlier point, unless you think, as I think Trump thinks, but he's not alone in this in thinking this way, unless you think the only thing that people understand is an overawing display of power, which both incapacitates by incarcerating and instills fear from it's the pedagogy of fear. You know, Hobbes wrote a book about this, <laughs> you know, the importance of fear and um, demobilizing people. But I, that's, uh, if you don't think that, 
Well, as I watch people smashing windows on Odeo Drive um, in the Buckhead section of Atlanta, yeah. on North Michigan Avenue in uh, Chicago, uh, in uh, Soho in New York City, as I watch them walking out with uh, big screen yeah. TVs and arms full of sneakers and uh, going into jewelry stores and whatnot, and I see this breaking out in a dozen cities, yeah. in a score of cities across the country, uh, I'm not sure that we're not at the point where uh, you can't just let it. I mean, <laughs> you you need a strategy. Maybe it's above my pay grade exactly what that strategy is. But you can't just let mobs of people go into police stations and burn them down and stand idly by uh, w- without sowing the seeds of something something uh, horrible. It, it yeah, seems to I me. Mean, we, this is the the the. the dilemma that we're in you can't let police be murdering uh, unarmed people of course and of course the with that smug prick look on his face and the well, let's the deal top. with let's deal with him by all means let's deal with him but the question is what do i do with this mob that's burning down the police station do i shoot somebody or do what i need to do in order to get them to desist or do i let them burn the station down you know what you what you do is what people do in these circumstances, which is that you respond differently in different circumstances, and you try to avoid getting into that situation by every means possible. And that's what I don't think is happening. And I put the principal responsibility, and this is where we disagree about your piece. I put the principal responsibility. I, there's a lot of responsibility to go around, but I put the principal responsibility on people who whose job it is. I mean, politicians, I mean, officials, I mean, cops, people whose job it is to protect. And they haven't been doing their job. And if they're not doing their job, then to then to jump to getting all, you know, high and mighty about, you know, there's, you know, property damage, et cetera, et cetera. Well, do your fucking job. I mean, uh, that's but this is an old this is an old familiar uh, issue. I think there's a need for leadership, and I don't mean just by the president, who's incapable of it, uh, I, and the people around him seem equally incapable of it. But there are, I mean, I watched the Houston police chief make a very beautiful and impassioned speech about Houston being a multiracial, multi ethnic city and the cop yeah. one. And we, we've also, there are lots of people who are doing really, really hard stuff, hard stuff to try to move this to a better place. Okay. And Godspeed to those people. Godspeed to those people. Yeah. Yeah. All right, Josh, I think that's a wrap for the time being anyway, uh, the difficult circumstances. Good to talk to you. Good to talk to you, Clint. Thanks.